Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Reason. Individuality which takes itself to be real in and for itself. Reason as lawgiver. Spiritual essence is, in its simple being, pure consciousness and this self-consciousness. The originally determinate nature of the individual has lost its positive meaning of being in itself the element and the purpose of its activity. It is merely a superseded moment and the individual is itself in the form of a universal self. Conversely, the formal matter in hand gets its filling from the active self-differentiating individuality for the differences within the latter constitute the content of that universal. The category is in itself or implicit as the universal of pure consciousness it is equally for itself or explicit for the self of consciousness is equally a moment of it. It is absolute being for that universality is the simple self-identity of being. Thus what is object for consciousness has the significance of being the true. It is and it is authoritative in the sense that it exists and is authoritative in and for itself. It is the absolute matter in hand which no longer suffers from the antithesis of certainty and its truth, being universal and individual, between purpose and its reality. Uh, but truth existence is the reality and action of self-consciousness. Uh, this matter in hand is therefore the ethical substance, and consciousness of it is the ethical consciousness. Its object is likewise for the it the true. For it combines self-consciousness and being in a single unity. It has the value of the absolute, for self-consciousness cannot and does not want any more to go beyond this object, for in it it is in communion with itself. It cannot, for it is all being and all power, it does not want to, for it is the self or the will of this self. The object is in its own self real as object, for it contains within itself the distinction characteristic of consciousness. It divides itself into masses or spheres which are the determinate laws of the absolute essence. These masses, however, and do not obscure the notion, for the moments of being and pure consciousness and of the self remain enclosed within it a unity which constitutes the essence of these masses and which in this distinction no longer lets these moments fall apart from one another. Uh, these laws or masses of the ethical substance are immediately acknowledged. We cannot ask for their origin and justification, uh, nor can we look for any other warrant. For something other than essence it is in and for itself can only be self-consciousness itself. But self-consciousness is nothing but this essence for his itself, the being for self of this essence. For this itself, I think I should say. For this itself, the being for self of this essence, which is the truth, just because it is as much the self of consciousness as it is it's in itself or pure consciousness. Since self-consciousness knows itself to be a moment of the being for self in the, of this substance, it expresses the existence of the law within itself as follows. Sound reason knows immediately what is right and good, just as it knows the law immediately, so too the law is valid for it immediately, and it says directly this is right and good. And moreover, this particular law, the laws are determinate, the law is the matter in the hand itself, filled with a significant content. What is thus given immediately must likewise be accepted and considered immediately. Just as in the case of my sense certainty, we had to examine the nature of what it immediately expressed as being, so here too we have to see how the being expressed by this immediate ethical certainty or by the immediate, immediately existing masses of the ethical substance is constituted. Examples of some such laws will show us this, and since we take them in the form of declarations of the, set of the sound reason which knows them, we do not have first to introduce the moment which has to be made valid in them, considered as immediate ethical laws. Everyone ought to speak the truth in this duty as expressed unconditionally the condition will at once be admitted, if he knows the truth. The commandment, then, will now run, everyone ought to speak the truth at all times, according to his knowledge and conviction. Sound reason, this ethical substance precisely, which knows immediately what is right and good, will also explain that this condition 
was already so much part and parcel of that universal maxim that this is how it meant that commandment to be understood. But with this admission, it is in fact it in fact admits that already in the very act of saying the commandment, it really violates it. It said everyone ought to speak the truth, but it meant he ought to speak it according to his knowledge and conviction. That is to say, what it said was different from what it meant, and to speak otherwise than one means means not speaking the truth. The untruth or inept expression in its improved form now runs everyone ought to speak the truth according to his knowledge and conviction at the time, but with this correction. What the proposition wanted to enunciate as universally necessary and intrinsically valid has really turned round into something completely contingent, for speaking the truth is made contingent on whether I can know it and can, can convince myself of it, and the proposition says nothing more than it is confused, a confused muddle of truth and falsehood ought to be spoken just as anyone happens to know, mean and understand it. This contingency of the content has universality merely in its in the propositional form in which it is expressed. But as an ethical proposition, it promises a universal and necessary content, and thus contradicts itself by the content being contingent. Finally, if the proposition were rectified by saying that the contingency of the knowledge and conviction of the truth ought to be dropped, and that the truth ought also to be known, then this would be a commandment which directly contradicts the one we started from. Sound reason was at first supposed to possess immediately the capacity to speak the truth. Now, however, it is said that it ought to know. That is to say, that it does not immediately know what is true. Looking at it from the side of the content, then this has uh, dropped out in the demand that we should know the truth. For this refers to knowing in general, we ought to know. What is demanded, therefore, really is therefore really something free of all specific content, but here the point in question was about a specific content, a distinction in the ethical substance. Yet this immediate determin determination of the substance is a content which showed itself to be really completely contingent and which, when raised into universality and necessity by making the law refer to knowing instead of to content, in fact vanishes. Another celebrated commandment is love thy neighbour as thyself. It is directed to the individual in his relationship with the other individuals and asserts the commandment as a relationship between two individuals or as a relationship of feeling active love. For love that does not act has no existence and is therefore hardly intended here. Aims at removing an evil from someone and being good to him. For this purpose I have to distinguish what is bad for him, what is the appropriate good to counter this evil, and what in general is good for him. That is, I must love him intelligently. Unintelligent Unintelligent love will perhaps do him more harm than hatred. Intelligent substantial benef beneficence is, however, in its richest and most important form, the intelligent universal action of the state, an action compared with which the action of a single individual, as an individual, is so insignificant that it is hardly worth talking about. The action of the state is, moreover, of so great a power that, if the action of the individual were to oppose it, and either were intended to be a downright explicitly criminal act, or the individual out of love for someone else wanted to cheat the universal out of its right and its share of and its share in the action. Such an action would be altogether useless and inevitably frustrated. The only significance left for beneficence, which is a sentiment, is that of an action which is quite single and isolated of help in a situation of need, which is a contingent, uh, which is as contingent as it is transitory. Chance determines not only the occasion of the action, but also whether it is a work at all, whether it is not immediately undone or even perverted into something bad. Uh, thus, this acting for the good of others, which is said to be necessary, is of such kind that it may or may not exist. It's such that if by chance the occasion offers, the action is perhaps a work and is good, but also perhaps not. This law, therefore, as little has a universal content as the one we find first considered, and does not express as an absolute ethical law, should, something that is valid in and for itself. In other words, such laws stop short of ought. They stop short at ought. They have no actuality. They are not laws, but merely commandments.
It is evident, however, from the very nature of the case, that we must give up all ideas of a universal absolute content. For my determinateness, placed in the simple substance, whose nature is to be simple, is inadequate to it. The commandment, in its, in its simple absoluteness, itself expresses an immediate ethical being. The distinction appearing in it is a determinateness, and therefore a content subsumed under the universality of the simple being. Since then, all idea of an absolute content must be given up. It can only claim a formal universality or that it is not self-contradictory. For universality that lacks a content is merely formal, and an absolute content itself is tantamount to a distinction, which is no distinction, that is, two absence of content. All that is left, then, for the making of a law is the mere form of universality, or, in fact, the tautology of consciousness, which stands over against the content and the knowledge not of an existing or re a real content, but only of the essence of self or self-identity of a content. The ethical nature, therefore, is not itself simply as such a content, but only a standard for deciding whether a content is capable of being a law or not. That is, whether it is or is not self-contradictory. Reason, as the giver of laws, is reduced to a reason which merely critically examines them.